Hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out despite the probability of rain here, even in Lubbock. Uh, nice to see you all tonight. Uh, I'm Ben Pollan, the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Uh, the Free Market Institute was founded in 2015 to promote the study of uh, the free enterprise system and uh, teaching and research related to it. And as part of that, we promote this public lecture series we have here on campus and are pleased to have you with us here tonight for it. And before I introduce our speaker, uh, I will have to mention our next upcoming lecture in this series, uh, which is coming up on Tuesday, November 2nd, uh, same time, although a different place, over at the McKenzie Market Center, not far from here. We're going to have Matt Ridley, uh, who's going to be giving a talk about his most recent, or his almost most recent book, How Innovation Works. It was his most recent book when we agreed to have him come, and that was right before all of the COVID stuff started happening. And Matt is in the United Kingdom. In fact, he's a member of the House of Lords there, although that's not why we invited him here. We invited him because he's a best-selling author, a great intellectual, and very fun lecturer that we had a number of years ago. Uh, he now has a new book up, about COVID up to. He's going to be talking about how innovation works. Uh, that'll be November 2nd, uh, McKenzie Market Center, uh, same time. It uh, should be great fun. And he's verified that he can come here from the UK, even if those travel restrictions don't, don't, don't last, because he's got a US citizen for a wife, uh, so it's exempt, because people were worried about him flaking on He's like, no, no, I'm good for it. So uh, that'll be our next event. But uh, to focus on tonight, uh, we're very pleased to have with us Jason Brennan. Uh, he is the Robert and J, excuse me, Robert J and Elizabeth Flanagan, prof family professor of strategy, economics, ethics, and public policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. Uh, he earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Arizona. He special, specializes in politics, philosophy, and economics. Uh, he edits a, uh, a journal, uh, Public Affairs Quarterly. <laughs> He's authored 13 books already and has seven more under contract in various stages of development. These books have been translated 24 times. I will not go through and list every one of these books, although a few of my personal favorites includes When All Else Fails, Violence and State Injustice, uh, in Defense of Openness, for those of you who know what I write about immigration, uh, In Defense of Openness, Global Justice and Global Freedom, uh, and then a particularly fun one that was very timely when it came out, Against Democracy. Uh, and here, to, uh, actually, also, I should, would be amiss if I didn't say one near and dear to the topic of the Free Market Institute, uh, Markets Without Limits, about why we should have markets and a whole bunch of things that we're not allowed to otherwise. Uh, and as fun as any one of these books and a discussion of them could be from Jay, I thought it was going to be really fun. They had a book that came out last year called Why It's Okay to be, Want to Be Rich. And I think this is a message that particularly our all student, College of Business students here at Texas Tech should hear, but really everybody else too. So I would say without further ado, before that I will say this other, one other good thing about Jay is that he has very good taste in sports. Uh, which means that he's a New England Patriots and Boston Red Sox fan uh, because he and I grew up both in the Merrimack Valley in Massachusetts. And uh, usually we're riding high on this. And, uh, this year it's a little bit rougher. Uh, we'll see what the next couple of days bring for our, our Red Sox. Uh, but then uh, Sunday night's particularly interesting when Tampa Bay plays. Uh, so please join me in welcoming a good sports fan and a great scholar, Jay Brennan. Thanks for having me. Just make sure this is working. All right. All right. So, um, hold on. I'll get back. Starting off awkward. All right. Just like the Patriots are starting off awkward this year. Uh, thanks very much for having me out here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit why these books exist. Rutledge is a prominent publisher in philosophy, and they have this idea that philosophers like me have a tendency to point our fingers at other people and wag them and go, you're bad for all the stuff that you do. Now, I'll confess something about my colleagues. They don't actually live any differently. They're very moralizing, but they're not particularly moral. And they have this idea that, like, what if we try to sort of defend common sense behavior? The way that people actually choose to live, the way that they actually choose to act, 
what if that stuff's okay? And they asked me to do a book on that, and I thought, you know, I'd like to talk about wanting money, because I've been poor by American standards, and I've been rich by American standards, and rich is a lot better. And I think it's okay to like having that money, and I think we shouldn't feel so ashamed about it. So that's really what this book is about, is about the pursuit of money and why it's okay to want to have this kind of thing, to make money and so on. When you compare, uh, and one reason to write this is that when you actually look at what Americans think about this and you survey their behavior and their attitudes, you find that they almost have like a split personality disorder when it comes to money. Right? So on one hand, most people want to get rich, but they feel kind of bad about that desire. Like it's kind of base and materialistic. They love to like flaunt their wealth by wearing like fancy watches and so on, but they really hate it when other people do it. They like to watch TV shows about rich people like the Kardashians, but they also tend to think that rich people are awful and bad. Um, when Gordon Gecko says greed is good, they nod along in approval, and when that greedy bastard goes to jail, they clap. Right? So we have this little split personality disorder when it comes to thinking about money, because most of us would like to have more, and at the same time we feel kind of bad about it. So what should we really think? When you go and you ask the various like, philosophers and other people <coughs> out there, they tend to have defend three positions, which I think are not really defensible. They'll say, it's wrong to want money. If you were a truly good person, you wouldn't really need more money. A good person would be able to kind of live in a very simple lifestyle, live simply so that others may live, not really be concerned with material wealth, and be happy living a completely ascetic lifestyle with very little stuff. And further, making money itself is a bad and base thing. So many of my colleagues, even at like the business school that I work at, I have colleagues that basically say to students, when you work as a business person, that's you taking from society. And the only thing that could justify and wash the stains off your hands at the end of the day is if you give some of that money back to, well, I have a list of causes that I think you should choose, including donating it to us to pay for my salary and you know, my BMW downstairs, right? That kind of thing. But otherwise, it's wrong to make money. And if you do get money, you should pretty much give away almost all that you have. You often see these attitudes pushed by a large number of people, uh, people who don't usually live by these positions, but nevertheless say them. So I want to argue a contrary position. I think it's OK for you to want to make money. In fact, you should. Money is worth the wanting. Right? Money actually does a lot for us. It's one of the greatest inventions ever. And wealth really does genuinely enrich our lives and make it better. Further, it's OK to make money. And for most people here, the thing, that you will, the thing that you will do that will most contribute to the world, that will make the world a better place, is the thing that you do for work and the thing that you do for money. The typical motorcycle mechanic is going to do a lot more for society by fixing motorcycles for profit than they are by voting or volunteering or other kinds of things that they can do. It's not that those things are bad, but the thing that you're doing for money is often like the way you're making your biggest contribution. And you shouldn't be ashamed of that. You should celebrate that stuff. And finally, if you do find yourself fortunate enough to have extra money, which you, if you're here, you will, uh, you should give some back and you should consider joining to various kinds of charities, but you're not living in this kind of perpetual debt to society. You can keep some of it for yourself. You don't have an obligation to give all of it away. So why think that? What's the argument? Right, and why do you think that this matters? Right? Why even get concerned about this? Well, there's a number of reasons to be concerned. One is, I remember the first time I gave a talk like this, someone said, why are you so concerned to defend the rich? Who cares about their feelings? And I said to her, do you care about your feelings? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I'm here talking about you. You're the rich. When I'm talking about the rich, you. You're the 1%. You know, people have, a couple years ago, people are walking around with signs about the 1%. There's like a whole camp in DC where I work of people complaining about the 1%. And all the people in that camp are in the 1%. They just don't realize it. Because what does it take to be in the 1%? Well, if you mean the 1% of the United States, yeah, you need quite a bit of money. But what about the 1% globally? If you make $36,000 a year in current US dollars, you are in the global 1%. You are the rich. You are among the richest people ever to have lived. That's how rich you are. Uh, if you're at the poverty line in the United States, taking into account that it's more expensive to live here than most other countries, if you make $12,600 a year in the United States, you're considered at the poverty line, you are still in the top 20% of income earners worldwide. So when we're talking about the rich, you might picture Oprah Winfrey or Jeff Bezos or like Dr. Dre, right? Those are really, really, really rich people, and they are. But I'm talking about you and me, ordinary rich people. We're the rich. One reason that this matters is because it matters when we think about what it takes to make a positive contribution to the world. 
Many of my colleagues will say things like, what it means to be a positive contribution to the world is, yeah, you do your work, you do some other stuff, but you should be like an amateur political scientist and like spend a lot of time thinking about politics. And that's, that's really where all the action is. But actually, you have to know what really helps people and makes their lives better. And if you're mistaken about these things, you'll spend a lot of time in your altruistic endeavors working on things that don't really make people's lives better, aren't really of service, when you could have been doing something that was. It also matters because if you have this kind of split personality disorder that many Americans have, where you want money but feel bad about it, you like having it but feel bad about it, you'll spend a lot of time being guilty. And I want to kind of liberate people from that who don't deserve it. To feel that way. So why is it okay to want money? Well, let's start by asking a really rich person who almost got purchased a presidency by his dad. <laughs> so Robert Kennedy says, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our debate, the integrity of our public officials, such as the Kennedys, or measure neither our wit nor the courage, neither the wisdom nor learning, neither compassion nor devotion to the country. The gross national product measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. It's a great quote. Probably didn't write. You probably paid someone to write that for him. Right? I mean, really, you probably did. Because uh, he's loaded, and that's what he did. And then Kennedy's weren't really that smart. They kind of bought their way into Harvard. Uh, but also true. It'd be mean, but it's true. Right? Uh, the thing is, like, even when he says this, it's not even original. The guy who came up with the concept of the gross domestic product or gross national product said the same thing. He's like, at best, it's a proxy. What is GDP? It's just a proxy. It's just a measure of production. How much production is there in a particular country? And he's right. GDP measures things like if I sell you a cigarette and you register it, like, OK, there you go. That shows up in GDP. But it doesn't measure whether that was actually good for you to smoke it. It doesn't matter, measure what my motives were in selling it. It doesn't measure any of that. So who cares about that? What we really matters is the quality of life. And people say this as if they've been boozled economists, and they're going to go, oh, crap, we never thought of this. Let's just go home. I guess we can just delete all of our publications. But in fact, when we go and think about what this stuff actually does for us, we find the story is a lot more robust. In fact, money is buying us a lot of these things one way or another. So I want to start to think about this, just think about how you spend your own money. And I'm not going to ask you to do this. I often do this in class early on, but we won't have time for it here. Think of a list of things that you spend your money on. You might ask for things like, think of like things that you spend your money on, not basic, you know, shelter and basic clothing and basic food, but like luxury stuff you don't really specifically need. But if you think about it, it really makes your life a lot better. In fact, if you had like an evil genie came to you and said, you can either give up, you know, your third best friend or give up your whatever this object is, you'd really prefer to like keep the object and maybe not be friends with this person anymore. Right? Probably there's stuff like that. And then maybe on item two, you can think of things like stuff you spend your money on that. Maybe you buy it a lot, maybe you like it, but it doesn't really make your life all that much better and you could go without it. Maybe on item three could be things you spend your money on and you want, but you wish you didn't want. Like if you take a pill and make the desire for this thing go away, you would take it. And finally, maybe things other people spend their money on that you wish they didn't buy. Like for me, uh, item list one would be a lot of my guitar collection and amplifier collection. I have really nice stuff. Thank you, Georgetown Business School. Thank you for the Flanagan's for paying for that stuff. Uh, it's great. I love it. I have expensive stuff. When I was young and poor, I had crappy stuff. Now I have really good stuff. And I noticed the quality difference, and I love it. And if like a genie came to me and said, you could give up like your third friend, Tom, or all your guitars. Sorry, Tom, you're out of there. Like, I'd rather have the guitars. This stuff really enriches my life. At the same time, you know, going out to restaurants. I'm not a foodie. If I, if I never got to go to a restaurant, but again, it wouldn't really make much of a difference. You know, then there are things that I want that I wish I didn't want. Like, I wish I didn't want chocolate. Just take a pill and have that go away. It's so much, I'd be like, it's so much better shape. It'd be great. And finally, when it comes to being judgmental about consumer goods other people don't want, back in the day when I was in college, it would be Dave Matthews. Like, I wish they didn't listen to him. Constantly <laughs> hearing it, it's obnoxious. But I've managed to mostly avoid that now. So one lesson of this is, look, if your money's not making you happy, part of the reason might be because you're not spending it the right way. Like, figure out what's on item list one for you and spend it on that. It might be travel for me. No. You know, like I just told my wife today, I'm like, oh, good news, we're going to go to Paris like in June because of something. She's like, yay. She's so delighted. I'm like, I don't really care. But she'll be happy, right? Spend your money on the stuff that you want that makes your life better. But let's think more deeply about this. I have here a graph that's talking with data about what was it like to live in the United States at various points in history. 
Let's go back to the year 1870. In the year 1870, the United States is maybe the second, maybe the third richest country in the world, possibly the first, but probably second or third. And not only the second or third richest country in the world, but the second and third richest country ever to have existed in all of history by a lot. What was it like for people on average back then? Well, on average, in the 1870, the second or third richest country ever to have existed, you would start working full time at age 13. I have a 13 year old kid who's about to turn 14. The idea of him working full time in like a paying job kind of boggles my mind, though frankly he gets a lot of homework, so I guess he is kind of working full time in a way, right? When would you retire? It says death, because typically in the year 1870, in the third richest country ever to exist, you would work until you were too sick to work anymore, and then you'd spend like a week in bed while your kids tended to you, and then you'd die. Right? At life expectancy at birth was about 43 and a half years. That didn't mean that if you're about 43, I'm 42, it didn't mean like I would have a year and a half to go and then I'm like likely to kill over, but it meant that the death rate before age five was so high that on average you would like, you know, only have about 43 and a half years. If you made it to age five, you could expect to live to about 60. You would expect to live, work 5,000 hours per year, either outside the home for money or inside the home not for money. For women, you probably work a little bit more inside the home for not for money. For men, more outside the home not for money. And you would spend 61% of your life awake and working. Fast forward to the year 2021, the average American starts working full time at maybe about 23. They work both inside the home and outside the home less than 3,000 hours a year, more like 22 to 2,300. They have a massive retirement that tends to last about 20 years. They start working a lot later. And they only spend maybe about 21 to 25% of their entire life awake and working. The rest is spent on sleep and leisure. So one thing that money is buying for us is a lot more time to spend on frivolous pursuits and things and concerns and, and opportunities and hobbies and things like that. You know? <laughs> Things like worrying about what kind of lifestyle that you're going to lead. Like, have you heard the concept of a quarter life crisis? You know, you, you hit age 25 and you're like, what am I going to do with myself? Who am I going to be? Where am I going to work? Of all the opportunities available to me, which of these should I choose? Because every time I go down one path, I chop off other paths. You know who didn't have quarter life crises? Peasants living in England in the year 1000. They weren't worried about that. They weren't burdened by that kind of thing because they knew they were going to be poor. So what might be going on with money here? How could it possibly be buying us happiness? If you've probably encountered this concept before, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The idea here is that the things in the bottom of this hierarchy are the most urgent, and the things at the top are the most important. The things at the bottom are like the things you go for first, maintaining proper homeostatic air pressure on you, and the right temperature, and getting enough air, enough food, and that kind of stuff. And the things at the top are like self-transcendence, and self-realization, and you know, maybe, you know, fellowship with divinity or other kinds of higher level goods. And people tend not to pursue those higher level goods until they meet these basic goods. Money cannot really directly buy you those higher level goods, but what it can do is insulate you, perhaps, from the lower level things. It can buy you security. It can buy you like not worrying about food. Like I don't ever worry about whether my kids are going to be fed, but if I lived a thousand years ago in England, I would I'd worry about that every single day while I get my kids fed. I don't worry about whether they're going to be safe, but I would back in the day, right? So money can insulate you from these things and maybe give you more access to other things. Even thinking about something like the quality of marriage, right? It turns out, empirically speaking, that richer married couples are happier. Richer married couples are happier than poor married couples. Part of that's what's called the selection effect. If you if you're very conscientious, you tend to be end up being richer, and you also tend to be married better marriage partners, but part of it is just the number one thing that married couples fight about is money. And if you're rich, you don't worry about that. It's just not an issue. My wife and I fight. We don't fight about money. It's not an issue. It's just not something we're concerned about. So how can we know if this is true? Well, we can look at data. And back in the year 2006, uh, the economist Betsy Stevenson and the other economist uh, Justin Wolfers did a massive survey of 130,000 people all around the world getting a proper random sample from every country they go to. And what they found is this. Around the world, the richer people are, the happier they are. And back in the day, in like the 1990s when I was in college, what I was taught was the absolute level of wealth doesn't matter. All that matters is that you're richer than other people. Like, am I like, oh, I have a BMW, but, but Ben has a Porsche. Crap. So I guess he's better off. I feel crappy. But, you know, it doesn't matter what, how rich you are. It's just if you're richer than your neighbors. And so if that were true, he thought, like, oh, as you get richer and richer, you get happier until you get about $15,000 a year, and then it has no effect on your happiness unless you're richer than your neighbors. That turns out not to be true. Actually, what you find is around the world, the richer people are, in absolute terms, the happier they are. And that's that.
it does trail off. The first $50,000 makes a bigger difference in the next 50 than the next 50, but around the world we find this trend. But what's more interesting is why we find the trend. So here's what you see. They asked in the same survey questions like, did you feel respected yesterday? People from rich countries say yes. People from poor countries say no. Did you feel loved yesterday? People from richer countries are more likely to say yes than people from poor countries. Did you feel bored yesterday? People from rich countries are less likely to say yes than people from poor countries. Did you feel pain yesterday? People from rich countries are less likely to say yes than people from poor countries. Almost all these interesting moral emotions and actions are like correlated with being rich and anti-correlated with being poor. So again, it starts to look like, well, money doesn't directly buy us happiness. It doesn't directly buy us love, but it makes it more likely that we're going to get these things, in part because it protects us against the stuff that might interfere with it. It also buys us life. One of the biggest predictors of the life, the, how long you live, is how wealthy your country is. It's not, even medicine is not the big of a predictor. Ba vaccines matter a lot. Giving kids before age five all these vaccines protects them and makes it much more likely that they're going to live longer. But the next biggest indicators are things like, do you have access to basic nutrition and cleanliness? Wealth buys nutrition and cleanliness. It used to be like, if you, if you walk through Washington, D.C., say back in like, 1860, the streets are covered in filth, and you might think that they are kind of now too, in a different metaphorical sense. I'm not here to deny that. You know, my neighbors are like lobbyists and people like that. But like, uh, but but like literal horse filth, like, and that is disgusting. And you're constantly being exposed to diseases and this kind of thing. And you wouldn't have enough to eat, and so you're constantly sick, and constantly dying. And now, what you find is around the world, as countries get richer, they get, they live longer, they have more of life. So what could be more, a bigger in, increase in freedom than having more life to live? What about light? You know, look at how bright this room is. Uh, the Nobel, winning, Nobel Prize winning economist William Nordhaus did a famous series of studies on the price of light. He said, in the year 5000 BC, our sort of pre-homo sapiens ancestors, for them to acquire what's called a thousand lumen hours of light, which is roughly as much light as you get from burning about 60 candles, would cost them about 60 hours of work. In the year 1,000, it would probably cost you like 10 hours of work. So being able to like read to your kids at night before they go to bed and tell them a bedtime story, that, the books were expensive. It would cost you many, like weeks and weeks and weeks of work to order just off on one book. And the light was incredibly expensive. Now to get 1,000 lumen hours of light, something that you know, in the year 1800 would cost you about three hours of work, costs a typical American something like three or four seconds. So that's, that's when they have access to you, just being able to see, right? So the economists, uh, Bowdergy and a few other people, have done some studies on uh, how people think about profit. And what, this is what they tend to find. People around in the United States, which you tend to think of as a pretty pro-market, pro-capitalist country, have a sort of built-in prejudice against the idea of profit. This is what they think. So you might have heard of like studies where uh, um, you get people, like say, two resumes that are completely identical. But one has, say, like a Muslim-sounding name, and one has like a not-Muslim-sounding name. And then you ask them to rate them, and they'll rate the Muslim-sounding resume lower, even though the resumes are otherwise identical. That's showing sort of like a prejudice against that particular group. Right? That's what study probably heard about. They do the same kind of thing for profit. They describe to people, among, among their many studies, here's two organizations. They describe them exactly the same. They tell them one is for profit and one is not. And people will assume that the for-profit company hurts people, doesn't provide any value to others. The more profit it makes, the more harm that it does. And the more corrupt are the employees and the managers there. And the less money and the less profit something makes, the more good it must be doing. And oh, how backwards that might be. So that's the prejudice we start with. Is that prejudice correct? Can we justify it? Well, let's think about making money. It used to be throughout most of human history that making money kind of, there was something kind of suspect from it. Like if you look and say the Bible, Jesus says it's easier for the rich, for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than to enter heaven. And for your sake, I sure hope that's not true because I mentioned before, you're the rich. You're the rich people. In fact, the people he was calling rich back then are a lot poorer than you are today. Rich today is a lot richer than rich in the past. Like, you know, King Henry VIII had a uh, servant named Cromwell who was described as fabulously rich, and in his biography, as an example of how rich he was, they said, you won't believe it, he owned six shirts. <laughs> Cromwell, one of the richest people, he has six shirts. I'm guessing you have more than six shirts. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this is about you. And it kind of makes sense because throughout most of history, this is how society was organized. You have a bunch of peasants, <laughs> And then you have military people who lord over them. 
The military people don't provide much value and much service. They do provide some, but not much. And they just kind of expropriate stuff from the peasants, and the peasants do all the work. A lot of people think that's kind of how the society works now. What is it? So, you know, and further, like through a lot of human history, we lived in like small family clans of like only about 100 to 120 members who are at continuous and constant war with other family clans. So a lot of our cultural baggage and our moral architecture in our brains about how to think about money making are based upon this past history and also what was adapted for hunter-gatherers living in small tribes. But we don't live that way anymore. We now live in this massive market-based economic system where we're constantly cooperating with millions of people or billions of people we don't even know about. And you really are cooperating on the scale of billions. So something that economists like to ask is like, how many people does it take to make a pencil? And you might think the answer is like 200, and the actual answer is like 50 million. About 50 million people are involved in making a simple number two pencil. You're cooperating on a mass scale, and maybe your moral intuitions about how to think about cooperation on this mass scale don't quite match up to how that system actually works. So when we think about trade and markets is with a game that I like to play in class. I'll do this with my students in like the first day of class for running my classes. I walk in and I give everybody a, a unique candy bar. I say, I'm just gonna give you one at random, you might not like it, that's fine, just hold on to it for now. And I ask the students to rate the candy bars in a score of one to 10. 10 being the best possible single unit of candy you can get, one being utterly disgusting, like almond joys or Reese's Pieces or something like that. I hate peanut butter. Um, and then I say, all right, now you've got your score. Now what you do is take 15 minutes and trade with people as much as you want. Any mutually beneficial trade you want to make, make it. And what happens inevitably, if I do this in a class with 50 students, is that the total value of the candy will go up by 100 or 200 percent. The more people are in the class, the more it will go up. The more variety of candy, the more it will go up. People will like, start with something crummy and end up with something good. Even the poor end up off pretty well. Like People will start off with a candy that they rate as a one, and someone will trade with them because they have, someone likes eclectic things. Right? People have all sorts of weird tastes. There are people out there, does anyone here like uh, mounds? Mounds candy? See, there's some of you out there, right? <laughs> right? And then like me, I'm like, I hate peanut butter candy. You're like, that's, that's great stuff, right? We have different tastes. So we start trading with one another, and we create wealth in this class. We can double the product, like the gross domestic product of this class in 15 minutes, no problem, right? And no one loses. And all it's based on the ability to say no. You can just make a trade with somebody if you want to. If you don't like it, you get to say no. It works even if you only have crappy options. Even if you only start with a really gross piece of candy, it still works out that you're either better off or no worse off at the end. That's all fundamentally markets are, is systems of trade like that on a mass scale. What effect has that had? Well, I mentioned that you are the rich. You're not just the richest people alive today, you're the richest people alive in history. Right? This here is a graph showing economic production per person throughout history. As the great economist Deirdre McCloskey says, you can basically summarize it in a couple sentences. Economic history in three sentences is like this. Once upon a time, back in the day, everyone everywhere was poor. And then capitalism happened, and now we're rich. And this is the graph of how rich we are. Back in the year, say, 1 AD, the average person alive at that time was making about $450 a year in today's dollars. Think about how much that could buy. I'm adjusting for the cost of inflation. Think about what you could buy for $450. That's what they were living off of yearly. And that's the average. The kings and the nobles and the high priests were living a lot better. So the real typical people were living even worse than that. Now they're living off about $16,500 a year. Richest people have ever been. They're much, much better off. The typical person living in England today is about 40 to 50 times richer than their counterpart was 1,000 years ago. Someone like me, if I'd been born in Lowell, Massachusetts in the year 1879, given my personal circumstances, I might have been a criminal, I might have like worked in a, if I walked out, I might have worked in a textile mill. That's like what I probably would have ended up as. And now I'm doing way, way better than that. And it's not because of something special to me, it's because I was lucky enough to be born 100 years later than that, because of the, all this economic growth. People are living, like, and almost all countries have gotten richer, by the way, over the past 50 years. This growth, it doesn't touch everyone equally. It touches some places faster than others. You can take classes with the econ department and explain why, or you can take classes with the history department and give you the wrong theory why. But you pick one or the other, right? So what's going on here? What's really happening? Well, we have this prejudice that profit making is a terrible, awful, evil, no good, very bad thing. But that's a mistake. It's not, it's not understanding what profit really is. Here's how profit fundamentally works. 
you take the, the value of the stuff that you have is determined by the market. It's determined by the forces of supply and demand. It's determined by everything everyone else knows and everything everyone else cares about and all of the actions and choices they make in light of what they care about and what they know. And that will give rise to the prices of the things that I use in my business. And here's what happens. I take that stuff and if I, I place a bet, if I, if I can transform something that's valued in this much into something that other people value more, I now have an opportunity to make a profit. I get to keep some of that. That's where profit comes from. If I'm wrong, like if I have the idea, I don't know, what if I take MacBooks and I smash them up and I make them into busts of Jason Brennan and I put them on the market on eBay or Etsy, you know, and I spend like 5000 per one and I don't sell them for anything, well then I get to sell them for less and I lose money. That's the market saying, this was not a good idea, stop doing that. If I make a profit, this is the market saying, you are making value for other people. In fact, under normal market conditions, if it's a competitive market and you're not imposing costs upon third parties, the more profit you're making, the more value you're creating for others. I have this project I do with my students in class called the Ethics Project, where I give them $1,000, um, not my own money, from donors, thank you donors, uh, I give them $1,000 from various donors, and I say, think of something good to do and do it. And one of the things I tell them and they learn is if they run a business, it's actually, and one of the questions they have to ask is, do you add value to the world with whatever your actions are? If they run a for-profit business, it's actually really easy to figure this out. I made a profit, all right, I added value. That means I took things people value this much and I transformed them into something people value this much. I got to keep some of that proof, I added value. If they do a charitable action, which are good things to do too, it's actually really hard to tell. All right, we fed, we spent $1,000 and worked for 40 hours and we fed 15 homeless people. Do we make the world a better place? Well, it's great that we've had the homeless people, but we also consumed $1,000 in all this time. How do we commensurate those? It's a puzzle. So contrary to what most people think, the more profit you're making, probably the more value you're adding in most cases. Right? So you often see business people, like this is the dean of, former dean of Wharton, the you know, most prominent business school, not my dean, but Wharton. Uh, it's talking about how they think about what we do as business people. And he says, at work, we believe the role of business is to advance society as a whole, creating new wealth and economic opportunity for all people, developing regions as well as in developing countries. That might seem like a cop-out, but it's not. It's not a cop-out for a couple reasons. One is, contrary to what like, the people in the English department might say or something, it's actually really hard to make more wealth for people. It's really hard to run a business and make a profit. It's really hard to actually create value and to run these things successfully. If it were easy, everyone would do it and everyone would be making profit all the time. But it's also a cop, like, not a cop-out because that really does matter. For most of us, the main way that we're going to add value to the world is by the kind of productive work that we do. It doesn't mean that other kinds of work don't add value, but that's one key thing that we'll spend a lot of time on. And we shouldn't feel ashamed of that. We should feel grateful to one another for the contributions we make. Of course, not all ways of making money are equal. Right? It depends upon how you make the money. Right? There are exploitative and harmful ways of making money where you should feel ashamed of it. So if the way that I make money is, you know, I, pro I create a product that you like, and you're willing to buy, and you have the right to say no, and you value that product more than like, the money that you give me for it, and I make money from that, that's great. Like, I haven't harmed you, it made your life better, you're better off, I'm better off, we're both happy. Most of the time, business is going that way. But not always. There are examples of places where, like, companies or groups that they make money by exploiting people, and, like, they get rich, but it's not really in a kind of good way. So an example would be, like, the English department in most universities, right? They're pretty exploitative. Uh, I have a book back there called Cracks in the Ivory Tower, and, uh, Chapter four is about, or maybe it's five, is about uh, why you have to take gen ed to English. Right? Why do you have to take so many writing courses? And the answer is, the writing courses actually don't make you write any better. We can prove that empirically. However, the biggest predictor that you'll be forced to take a class in a particular field at a, at a university is how financially needy that department is. The more money they need, the more likely you should force to take a class with them. They lobby the uh, gen ed community extensively to make you take classes, and then they get more money. So the English department, maybe they should feel bad because they're mostly exploitative and exploit students for their own personal benefit, but then say, Mesa Boogie, my favorite amplifier company, they should feel great because what they do is they create awesome products and they make the world a better place and make music better and make, enrich the world through their profit-seeking activity. So yeah, of course, not all profit-seeking is good. The English department's like profit-seeking isn't good, but most of it is. When you leave the department university and walk out to like, you know, the street and see the businesses down there. Most of what they're doing is making the world a better place. What's so shameful about that? And as my friend uh, Chris McDonald says, you know, sometimes people say, no, no, that stuff's shameful. What you have to do is give back. But he's like, but they're already giving back. 
right? And she's like, we're kind of mean to business because we say stuff like this. You know, we think you have to engage in so-called corporate social responsibility. And that stuff can be good, it can be useful, it can make the world better, but it's not the whole story. He says, one way of putting this is that you can say to a company, it makes perfect sense to say that you make a useful product, you provide a useful service, you provide employment, you provide an investment opportunity for investors, you follow the laws and the regulations, and you pay taxes. And then after the company does all that, turn to them and go, yeah, but what have you ever done for society? that. Right. Again, I'm not saying that's the whole of everything you should do, but that is something that counts for a lot. It's something that matters. Now, I mentioned before, like, you know, some countries are rich and some countries are poor, and there's a difference in here, and you know, I've sort of defended money making in general, but you might think, well, one reason countries are rich and other countries are poor has to do with the way world history has gone. Because we know that some of these rich countries have engaged in massive amounts of imperialism and stolen from other countries. Is that why they're rich? Interestingly, we have an answer to that question. Uh, Adam Smith, when he was writing The Wealth of Nations, he was actually, that was like the first great big anti-imperialist book. So he was wondering about this too, because he says, oh, like, this is what's puzzling to me as Adam Smith. England has a smaller empire than Spain, but England is richer. The Netherlands has a smaller empire than France, but the Netherlands is a lot richer than France. England and, ne and the Netherlands have far, far fewer natural resources than Spain and France, but they're significantly richer. What can explain this? What's going on? So what Adam Smith does in the Wealth of Nations book four in particular is he scrupulously gets data and calculates what is the total economic value of all of the stuff that England is getting from its empire, from all the people it's conquering and killing and taking. How much is that stuff? What is Spain getting from its empire? How much is that stuff worth? And then he figures out how much does it spend on taxes to pay for that empire? Empires aren't free. You need military. You need to like outfit soldiers and send them overseas to kill people and so on. How much does that cost to do that? And what he determines is roughly to, to sort of simplify it: for every dollar's worth of stuff England gets from its empire, it's spending two dollars. So it can't be the secret to why we got rich. It'd be like if I came in here and I mugged all of you and I got like walked out with hundred thousand dollars, but I spent two hundred grand on the on the pistol that I used to mug you. Like I'm worse off, right? What's really going on? He says with England and Spain and others, it's like. Some people get rich. The king gets rich, and the ministers who kind of run the military, and the person who gets a monopoly on trade, and the people who build the armaments that they sell to the government, you get rich from the empire. And the rest of the people in the imperial country, the rest of the people in Spain, the rest of the people in England, they are also victims of the empire. Not as much as the people being conquered, but they are victims because they're forced to go into the military, or they're taxed to pay for this stuff, and their lives are actually being worse, not better off. So you might think, oh, well, the reason some people are rich and others are poor has to do with just a re simple redistribution. Some countries stole stuff from others, they got rich, the other countries got poor. But that story doesn't check out. In fact, the countries doing the stealing were overall made worse off by the stealing, though there were concentrated benefits among the people at the top. But you can also see this wrong simply by looking at the graphs. Right? When you look at this graph here, and you see economic growth over time, this is not a story about really moving things around. Like if I came in here and took all the money out of all of your wallets and kept it for myself and then we measured how much money is in the room, it would be the same amount. I would have more, you would have less, but the line, the average, would be the same. That's not what we see here. Money has been created, not really moved, not merely moved around. The total amount of output, the United States two years ago, before the pandemic, produced by itself way more, like more like than twice what the entire world was producing in the year 1960. Stuff is being made, not merely moved around. So that can't be the whole story. You have to think, well, where is this creation coming from? What does it mean? So when you think about like, the contribution that a lot of us make, we're making it through the kinds of business activities we engage in, the sort of stuff we're doing for profit. That's how we're helping one another out. And we're helping one another out by giving them that money that's doing all that stuff for them. That's giving them, really, when you think about it, freedom. So it's the great Marxist philosopher who I spent a lot of my time arguing with, Jerry Cohen, says, this is a Marxist philosopher, not some like market libertarian philosopher. The Marxist philosopher, Jerry Cohen, says, money is really freedom. If you think about what money fundamentally is, it's freedom to live the lifestyle that you want. It's freedom to experience things that you want to experience. It's freedom to make choices authentic to yourself. The more of this you have, the more opportunity and freedom you have to live a life that's authentically yours. And when you're engaged in this massive amount these big market economies, where all of us are doing just a small part, the systematic effect of that is that we all have more of this stuff and more of that freedom and more of that opportunity. That's a thing to be celebrated, not a thing to be denigrated, or not a thing to say, 
yeah, you did all that, but that's shameful. How are you giving back? So let's talk finally about the question of giving back. Do you have to give it all away when you make it? There's some good arguments to that position. Um, there's a very famous philosopher named uh, Peter Singer who recently won actually a million dollar prize for being such a good philosopher, and he's giving all of it away. Right? And this is what he says. He argues that rich people like you should give away almost all of your money, including him. He says, I, Peter Singer, should give away all, almost all of my money. He doesn't. He gives away, he gave away the million dollar prize, and on average in a typical year, he gives away about 25% of it. He still has an apartment in Manhattan in addition to his house in Princeton, uh, New Jersey, and he also makes something like four hundred fifty dollars to $500,000 a year is a good estimate. And if you give away 25% of that, you're still like, really rich compared to Americans in general, not just people in general. So he gives away a lot, but not all of it. But he thinks we should give away more, and he thinks that you agree. He thinks you can prove it. And this is his argument to that effect. He says, I want you to imagine that you're like walking across campus one day, like, you know, there's a big rainstorm happening like tomorrow and things. So you're walking across campus tomorrow, and in one of the places where there's construction, there's like, you know, a ditch that they dug, and a little kid has fallen into the pool of water and is drowning, right? So you see this kid drowning, and uh, like you're walking along, and you have like your brand, well, those are cowboy boots, that won't work, but let's just say you're wearing like brand new suede shoes that cost like 500 bucks here and you see the kid drowning and as you know you can't get suede wet that'll ruin it so the thought occurs to you I can save this kid but in order to do that I have to jump in and save him right now and that will destroy my brand new blue suede shoes so if I so here's a question singer would ask according to you do you think you're obligated to save the kid for 500 bucks lose your shoes for 500 dollars are you obligated not it's a nice thing to do but you are morally obligated to jump in and save that little kid how many people say yes you should save the kid Almost everybody says yes to this. I'm not here to dissuade you. Please do save the kid. In fact, if you save, I'll tell you what, like, I, I really do mean this is on camera. You can hold me to this. If tomorrow you save a kid drowning on campus and it costs you $500, I will reimburse you. <laughs> if you feel that, like, it's right there. Hold me to it. Right? Yes, judge, I mean it. I have sound mind. I will reimburse you for the children that you saved. So he's like, okay, fair enough. But then he's like, it's kind of puzzling. What if it's like, we'll change it just a little bit. You're walking across campus, it's windy, the wind is blowing, you happen to be holding $500 cash in your hand, and a kid is drowning. In order to save him, you have to let go of the money and jump in the ground right now. But the money blows away and you don't get it back. Save the kid? Okay. So Singer says, you might see where he's going with this. There are kids dying right now, and you could save them for like 500 bucks, but you don't. What's up with that? You spend a lot of your money on things that you don't really need. Like, I mean, I always like to like, look around and pick on people. Often I'm in the classroom when I do this, and um, is that a MacBook? Yeah. All right, awesome. So I'll pick you. <laughs> All right. uh, you have a MacBook. Is it a MacBook Pro or just a MacBook Air? It's a Pro, yeah. It's a Pro. All right, good. I have a MacBook Pro, too, so don't, I'm going to make fun of you, but I, it's me, too. Right? <laughs> uh, for a MacBook Pro, like, that costs like $1,500 to two grand, depending on what type it is. It could be more, depending on which one it is. Uh, do you do a lot of video editing? Damn it. All right, you're the first person ever to say yes. All right, who else is a MacBook Pro? So you actually might need it. You have one. Do you do video editing? No. All right, thank you. I'll use you instead. All right, so you don't need it. You don't need it uh, for video editing. Do you do music production? No. Okay. So you're like email and Excel and Word. Yes, so. Okay, so you could have just bought like a Chromebook for $250, and with the $1,250 extra dollars you could have saved, you could have cured something like 45 people of blindness from trachoma, but you didn't. And we know why. We know psychologically what's going on. If there's like a little kid drowning in front of you, you feel the impulse to help and you do it. When you're just kind of aware that there are kids out there dying, it doesn't grab you the same way. But Peter Singer's point is, even if psychologically speaking those are different, morally speaking they're the same situation, aren't they? Like you could help and you don't. So should you help? And he's got a point. Maybe you should help more than you do. Maybe we should all help a little bit more than we do with things like this. But then he says, but if you should help that first kid, then just repeat, rinse, repeat, lather, and repeat. Help the second kid, help the third kid. Shouldn't you just keep helping children up until the point where you've helped so many kids that like, if you try to help them, you help even fewer? You should keep giving away your money to desperately poor people who are dying until the point where you're so desperately poor they'd have to help you back in turn. You should maybe just spend your entire life working for the benefit of others. So he thinks all that follows from this thought experiment where you agree if you found a kid drowning, you should save him. But I don't think it's right. I think what he would need is like a new thought experiment which doesn't quite get the conclusions that he wants. This new thought experiment would be something like this. You're walking across campus and you come across a giant pool and there's an infinite number of children drowning. 
And every time you save a kid, for the most part, that kid will in fact stay saved. You will actually save that kid's life. However, there's constantly new children falling in, and you could spend every waking moment saving kids, and if you wanted to, only sleep as much as the bare minimum needed to make sure you maximize your kid's saving. Are you obligated to spend all your life saving kids? Most of us don't think that. So the fact that we think you have to save the one kid doesn't mean that we think you have to save them all. It doesn't seem to follow from that. I think that's part of the puzzle. He kind of like misconstrued the implication of that. Probably common sense morality is right. Common sense morality holds you should give back, you should do charity, you should help, um, you should put, give the money places that genuinely help the world, not others, right? But at some point, you've kind of done enough. The more ability you have to help, the more excess cash you have, the more you should help. But at some point, maybe you've done your part, you have license to maybe live your life. So I think this is maybe the strongest argument for the idea you should give it all away. And it doesn't quite work, but really follows is you should give some of it away, and the more you have, the more you should. That's all that really seems to follow from it. But I think the situation is actually a little bit more complex than Singer thinks. Because here's what Singer would have said. Like, say in the year 1971 or 72 when he published this article originally, he would say, hey, Americans, don't buy stuff like VCRs and stereos and you know, transistor radios and like, things like that from Korea. You don't need that stuff. That's all luxury goods. Give it all away to like foreign countries, that are really for poor people that really need it. Just give it all away. And people didn't really listen to him. And the result of them not listening to him is that Korea, instead of being like a place that's poor that needs help, is a place that's rich and is in a position to help. Right? And the, us in this room, when we think about why we're rich and we're in a position to help, for the most part, and rather than needing help, for the most part it's because of past productive economic activity where people traded with one another. And did that instead of just doing charity all the time. So one thing that Singer had to realize, I think for the most part someone has realized, is that you can't shut down the engine of the economy and then expect to make everybody rich. You need the economy to keep going in order for us to be in a position to help in the first place. The reason why you know, I'm as rich as I am as compared to what I would have been 100 years ago or 200 years ago is not because it's something special to me. It's because in the past, people engaged in productive activity, they engaged in capital accumulation, they saved money, they made a productive system, and that puts us in a position to wonder how much we should give away instead of in a position where we wonder how much of a handout the king or nobles might give us. So that's important. But I think it's even harder than Singer realizes because there's actually a genuine dilemma here. If I want to help the world as much as possible, and I have, say, $100, there's a lot of things I could do with that $100. I could give it to a bunch of charities. I could give it to a charity called Scared Straight. Shouldn't, because every dollar I give them does about $200 worth of social harm, because they're such a bad charity, they make the world a worse place by a lot. Don't give them money. Scared Straight, no. Uh, I could give it to a charity called uh, against Malaria Foundation or Deworm the World Initiative. Every dollar I give them, I'm doing like 10 or $15 worth of good. And one of the biggest bang for the buck charities you can give to. Go to GiveWell.org to tell you who they are and what the evidence is. I could give it to a charity that kind of will waste that money and not do much good with it, like the English department again. Um, or I could spend it on things and like create a productive exchange between people that creates capital accumulation and makes us richer. Or alternatively, I could invest it. So let's say I take this $100 and I put it in like a Dow Jones index fund for like 50 years. This $100, 50 years from now, is going to be worth about like $3,700 or so, right? So if I want to help people, there's actually a puzzle. If I, I could help a, a small number of people now with that $100, or so I could invest it for 50 years, and then help a much larger number of people, and also in virtue of having invested it, make it so fewer people need help in the first place. So if my only goal in life is to help other people, it's actually not clear and in any given instance, like what the best thing is to do with that money. It's a genuine dilemma. I'm not saying this to make it easy on you, like, ah, oh, don't worry, just invest it. I'm actually saying if your goal is to help, it's really kind of hard to figure out what's the best mix of donation, investment, trade, et cetera. Singer treats it like, ah, oh, obviously just giving it to other people is going to be the thing to do, but actually it's not obvious. In fact, there are genuine trade offs. So if we want to help, we can do all sorts of things. So at the end of the day, what does this all mean? There's more to be said, there's more questions to be asked, I'm happy to take answers to objections and so on, but fundamentally we walk in, it's a typical American, you walk around thinking, I like money, I want to make more, and I feel really bad about that. I feel, I sort of, in virtue of the business that I do, I feel like I'm giving back to the community, but I'm constantly having people telling me that that's not enough, or that by doing business I'm taking and not giving. And that, you know, whatever much money I have, I should feel bad about it and give it all away. I don't think these things stand up to scrutiny. I think you put in a little bit of economic and a little bit of moral philosophical analysis of them, you realize it is okay to want money, 
It's okay, in fact, a good thing for you to make money. That's the biggest, one of the biggest ways that you will contribute to the world. And at the end of the day, you should help others with it, but you can keep some of it for yourself, and that's all okay. So with that, uh, thanks for your time, and I'm happy to take comments, questions, and objections.